Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, Donald Johnson, author of Occupied America. Donald Johnson is the author of Occupied America, British Military Rule and the Experience of Revolution. Uh, Which cities did the British occupy during the Revolutionary War? Uh, So the British occupied uh, six of the major port towns uh, in North America during the war. Um, They started out uh, occupying Boston. Uh, The occupation of Boston actually begins kind of a couple years before the war actually starts. Um, as uh, uh, military troops came in uh, the 1770s at various points to kind of uh, police the city uh, during protests uh, over the Stamp Acts and uh, various taxes imposed by Great Britain. Uh, After the war began, British troops uh, turned the occupation, what had been kind of a peaceful military occupation, if, if that can be a thing, into kind of a full-fledged military rule situation. Um, After they were forced out of Boston by the Continental Army uh, in March of 1776, uh, the British Army regrouped and uh, invaded and captured New York City and um, its hinterlands and occupied New York, Long Island, uh, and Staten Island until uh, really until the end of the war, until late uh, 1783. Uh, They also occupied Newport, Rhode Island uh, from December of 1776 until um, the fall of 1779, uh, and uh, Philadelphia from the summer of uh, 1777 through the summer of 1778. Charleston, South Carolina in uh, 1780 uh, through 1782, uh, and Savannah, Georgia from 1779 through uh, 1782. Um, And, uh, you know, these weren't the only cities in uh, colonial North America that the British occupied. Obviously, um, Cornwallis's troops occupied uh, Yorktown, uh, Virginia, uh, at a certain point um, towards the end of the war, there were other smaller towns and, and regions. Um, but as I argue in the book, these six cities were kind of the main loci of uh, American trade uh, in the British Empire. They were the port cities um, through which British imports came and supplied uh, colonists and uh, people in the countryside. Uh, and they were the export centers by, from which colonial goods went out to the rest of the British Empire. Uh, so while they weren't kind of the only places that the British occupied, uh, they were the most important uh, to occupy in terms of economic and political significance. So in addition to this, the economic and the political significance, was there a larger military strategic purpose in, in uh, holding these cities? Absolutely. And it's it's kind of all intertwined. Um, Most of these were the capitals of their respective colonies. Um, They were the centers not only of government, uh, which uh, had, uh, for the British at least, failed to uh, uh, stop the oncoming of of a revolt and a a revolution in 1775, uh, 1776. Um, But in addition to being kind of capital cities and centers of government, they were also legal centers. They were where courts traditionally met uh, and centers of administration for the the colonies. Um, And so from a practical standpoint, uh, they could be easy places to kind of hold and use as bastions to uh, uh, restore loyalty to the countryside, to kind of uh, source, uh, sally forth and uh, strike at key points of the revolutionary uh, military. Uh, in addition, uh, they also had kind of a morale 
or a, a psychological significance in the minds of colonial Americans. They're kind of the, the largest cities, the capitals, uh, the most important economically uh, to the lifeblood of the colonies. Uh, and in British hands, uh, provided a powerful kind of implicit argument over who was fit to rule in uh, revolutionary America, over whether uh, the revolutionaries, the Republican governments that emerged, could actually control um, and make these places as prosperous as they were during the uh, uh, British uh, period of control, uh, during the, highlight, the height of the, the empire in North America. Um, and the argument that a lot of uh, military administrators and, and generals and commanders wanted to make and wanted to prove to Americans is that they could restore prosperity and peace uh, and maintain it better than the revolutionary government. So there's these kind of competing uh, uh, sources of authority uh, and control over the major port towns uh, is a huge coup um, in, in trying to assert that authority over uh, a wavering and sometimes outright rebellious population. Now, before the British came into many of these cities, uh, they went through a period of rule by the revolutionary forces. Uh, what, what was that life like for the residents there? It was in many ways kind of uh, uh, traumatic. Uh, revolutionaries asserted their control of these cities in, in uh, often violent uh, and, and kind of coercive ways. Uh, you know, we tend to think of the initial stages of the American Revolution as, as fairly peaceful, right, as, as kind of the Continental Congress gathering in 1774 and 1775, uh, various state uh, uh, governments emerging, uh, or I should say provincial or colonial uh, independent governments emerging, creating state constitutions, kind of edging the British government out of uh, the uh, uh, arena of political authority, uh, so that by early 1776, all 13 of the uh, mainland North American colonies uh, have ejected their British magistrates and created kind of de facto independent states. Uh, but in reality, the revolutionaries pursued kind of a pragmatic and oftentimes coercive uh, uh, system of consolidating their control. Uh, and this isn't really surprising. If you look at other revolutions, like, for example, the, the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, uh, you know, revolutionary insurgents, you know, follow kind of the same playbook, seize control of the, uh, uh, the power centers, um, coerce those who are on the fence or who are against the revolution or, or the, the reforms that you, you want to impose uh, to either be silent or to go along. Um, and uh, kind of maintain control if needed through armed forces. Uh, and revolutionary leaders did, did all of these things. Um, the port cities were very divided uh, in the years before the outbreak of revolution in the 1770s between those who supported reform of the empire and protests against uh, taxation and new attempts at kind of arbitrary government uh, and those who supported uh, who supported those reforms and even went more radically in favor of uh, colonial independence from the British Empire. And you see kind of uh, as the revolution breaks out, uh, these radical factions moving to consolidate their control over the traditional centers of power. Uh, one of the best anecdotes that I found in my research uh, was the story of uh, a clerk uh, in Savannah, Georgia, uh, who wrote what, what I call kind of the James Comey memo of, uh, of revolutionary America. Uh, this was this occurred in early 1776 uh, in the opening stages of the American Revolution, um, as the Georgia Provincial Congress was taking control of the uh, uh, the Georgia State House or the Georgia uh, uh, Colonial House, the the courthouse uh, where the colonial administration had based itself in Central Savannah. 
Uh, and uh, this gentleman, Henry Preston, was uh, a royal clerk. He was the, basically the secretary to the royal government in charge of keeping meeting minutes, uh, maintaining records uh, and filing systems, um, and essentially doing the paperwork of the colonial government. And so he's awoken at about six in the morning with a, with a sharp knock on his door. Uh, and he opens the door and finds uh, someone he likely knows. Um, you know, the, these towns are not huge. And, and Savannah had a population of about 7,000. So, um, you know, he probably knew this person. It was a member of the revolutionary militia uh, that had asserted its authority in the weeks uh, previously. Uh, and they ask him to come to the courthouse, uh, which they've now broken open, and uh, the Georgia Provincial Congress is uh, planning to meet in later that day, uh, unlock his office, uh, which they couldn't get into, um, and hand over the uh, colonial records uh, and the, the great seal of the, the province of Georgia, which was literally the, the wax seal that the governor used to, uh, uh, to sign documents and, and seal laws, uh, which was granted authority by the king. Uh, and Preston, who had sworn an oath to the royal government uh, and to, to king and country, uh, says no. He says that, uh, you know, basically that that would be a violation of my oath. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm just going to stay home. Uh, so the, the gentleman who accosted him comes to his door, you know, says, all right, well, I'll be back. Uh, goes back and consults with the uh, revolutionary leaders uh, and comes back about two hours later with uh, two musket men, two armed members of the revolutionary militia. And this time he threatens Preston's safety, his home, uh, even his wife, uh, if he's not willing to come to the courthouse and uh, unlock his private office and uh, hand over the records of the province, the royal province, to the new revolutionary uh, uh, insurgency. Uh, and Preston, to his credit, still says no. He still says, you know, I won't hand over the keys. I'm not going to come and do that. You know, you can't intimidate me. I'm a, I'm a royal officer. Um, and, and when you stop and think about it, you might think, you know, from his perspective, you know, this is widely illegal, right? You know, he's sworn an oath to the king. Uh, if he violates that by going along with the revolutionary uh, uh, movement, uh, he could be hanged for, for treason. Uh, this is why I call it that so-called kind of Comey mem memo, because because it, it reminded me of of uh, the situation with James Comey uh, a few years ago at the beginning of the the Trump administration, uh, where he made sure to kind of write down everything that happened. And uh, this document that uh, I found at the Georgia Historical Society seems to be Preston kind of writing down what's happening uh, between him and the revolutionary committees uh, as it's going on, you know, to kind of document it in case it's called to question uh, in legal proceedings later on. Uh, in any case, the uh, uh, musket men and the representative of the Provincial Congress go back to the courthouse. Uh, he kind of sits in fear at his house for another few hours. And then around noon, uh, they return and they basically say, all right, look, we've broken into your office. Uh, you know, we, we bashed down the door um, you know, would you come and uh, at the very least make uh, sense of these records? There's papers everywhere. It's kind of messy. We can't tell what are your personal papers, uh, what are the provincial papers, and what are kind of the private correspondences of various officials. Um, and uh, the revolutionaries, you'll notice, are trying to at least pertain or at least follow some semblance of order and so they say you know we don't have any interest in your papers we don't have any interest in the private correspondences of the governor and his council you know what we have interest in are the public letters and the official letters uh that are being sent out as well as kind of the tax records the the records of the assembly and and the um the the state or the the colony um, and at this time, Preston says, all right, well, if you've already broken down the door, you know, then, then I'm kind of doing my duty as a royal official in at least protecting the records that I can. 
Um, and he describes the scene where he goes and he, he sees kind of in front of the uh, government house a whole bunch of uh, kind of armed militiamen from both Savannah and surrounding towns um, that are just kind of milling about. Um, he sees the doors to the building uh, uh, broken open and the locks smashed. Going in, he sees members of the Georgia Provincial Congress who were uh, a lot of kind of elite planters and merchants uh, who sided with the revolutionaries. Um, and he sees his office door kind of broken off its hinges uh, in order to uh, uh, a gain access. Uh, and so throughout the afternoon, he spends his time uh, kind of going through all of these documents, separating out private correspondence, his own records, um, and the public records of the colony, sorts everything into two large chests, um, hands over kind of under duress the uh, chest containing the official records to the Provincial Congress, uh, takes the other chest with the personal records home, uh, thinks he's he's pretty much done with this, uh, and then around 6 p.m. that night gets another knock on the door by this this representative of the revolutionary uh, movement, uh, who basically says, you know, were you thinking of leaving town anytime soon? Uh, to which Preston says, well, I wasn't before today, but you know, I think I probably will uh, try to make my way to England or Canada or or somewhere that's safer. Um, since there is kind of an armed rebellion seemingly in progress. Uh, and they say, you know, basically don't. Uh, you know, they, they almost put him under house arrest or, or kind of confine him to the town um, under suspicion of, of um, become, being kind of too loyal to the crowd. Um, and it, it's a, you know, it's, it's a lengthy example, and it's, it's uh, but I don't think it's unusual. I think this is kind of the way that, um, revolutionary authorities asserted uh, their control over territory and over these new colonies. Um, and it was kind of an intimate uh, uh, experience. Uh, Preston likely knew all of the individuals who were now intimidating him. Uh, they were his neighbors. They were quite possibly his friends. Um, or at the very least, members of uh, various social groups that, that he attended. Um, again, these are not big places, and, and kind of everyone knew everyone else. Uh, and these are really kind of traumatic experiences that occur up and down uh, the eastern seaboard uh, as revolutionary governments kind of assert their control over these areas. Uh, in another instance, um, a uh, royal tax collector in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, who had lived there for about 20 years, had married, uh, he was himself was, was from England, but had married the daughter of a prominent uh, Rhode Island family, uh, had made a life for all intents and purposes in his, his uh, the colony that, that he had made, that he had uh, adopted as his home. Uh, he's forced at the last minute uh, when he's tipped off that revolutionary authorities are coming uh, for the tax revenue that he's collected. He's got a chest of uh, gold and silver and uh, paper currency that he's collected as, as tax revenue uh, over the past uh, several months uh, before transmitting it on to uh, Great Britain. Uh, he's tipped off that uh, the revolutionary militia is on the way to his house to seize that money. Uh, and in a split second, he decides that he's got to take it and flee aboard a British warship uh, in Newport Harbor. Uh, and he's never able to go back. Uh, he ends up on the warship uh, for a few months, uh, only about, you know, 300 yards from his house, um, but uh, he's not able to see his wife. Uh, they correspond uh, by letter during this, and it's, they have these really kind of heartfelt letters between the two of them while he's stuck on this ship. Uh, and then he ends up leaving, uh, heading up to Canada with the Royal Navy and ends up in Great Britain for the rest of the war uh, and for the rest of his life. He has to abandon his... Um, uh, his adopted home and, and family in Rhode Island. Um, so, you know, when the revolutionary seized control, uh, you know, it wasn't 
necessarily kind of the peaceful uh, transfer of power that uh, that we're used to thinking about. Now, you mentioned uh, revolutionary militias, and uh, you say in the book that by the end of 1776, Philadelphia's revolutionary militia had become a power unto itself in asserting control over the city. And you say that, that the incipient militia became an institution of radicalization similar to Oliver Cromwell's new model army during the English Civil War, comprising a power base entirely separate from both the Continental Congress and the incipient state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it sounds like it didn't really have a lot of civil control over this militia. Absolutely, absolutely not. Um, so, and, and you see this in a couple of different colonies. The Virginia works the same way. Massachusetts, to some degree, as well, um, where there there are groups. And in Pennsylvania, they're called uh, associators. Uh, in Virginia, they're volunteer companies. In Massachusetts, they're they're Minutemen, kind of very famously. Uh, though there were Minutemen also in other in other colonies. Um, but yeah, these are these kind of groups of uh, essentially small farmers, laborers, uh, craftspeople, um, you know, the, the, the kind of middle and lower classes of society um, who associated together in uh, armed groups, which were ostensibly under the leadership of uh, elites. Um, but uh, when they came together and began kind of reading uh, uh, and being inculcated with revolutionary ideas, uh, they kind of took them a little bit further than even the people who wrote those ideas down um, and who were trying to kind of direct the resistance and the protest movement against Great Britain. Uh, in many cases, they kind of forced the hand of the revolutionaries, or at least the revolutionary leaders. Uh, this, you can see this in, in a couple of ways. In uh, Massachusetts, kind of the, the famous example is that in the wake of uh, the outbreak of violence at Lexington and Concord, uh, which was not directed by any real revolutionary leaders, it was, it was kind of a bottom-up uh, uh, process where militiamen from around the countryside heard about shots being fired on Lexington Green, shouldered their muskets and started walking towards the, the area so that by the next day, there were about 20,000 of them in the outskirts of Boston, largely kind of leaderless. Um, in Philadelphia, you see it kind of even taking a, a more political aspect. Uh, and I'm not the first historian to, to really remark on this. Uh, you can see this in, in uh, Gary Nash's work on, on cities during the revolution, as well as, as Carl Breidenbaugh's uh, uh, classic on um, kind of cities in the colonial and revolutionary period. Um, but in any case, what happens uh, as the Philadelphia uh, Council uh, Revolutionary Council is is trying to decide on the question of independence. Uh, they meet and they uh, decide to instruct their um, delegates not to vote for independence yet. So this is this is kind of February March of 1776, as the independence question is is coming to a fore in the National Continental Congress, which is meeting in. Um, the Pennsylvania State House, which is now called uh, Independence Hall, um, you know the the uh, Philadelphia Convention, the uh, um, Pennsylvania Convention, uh, is meeting a few uh, houses down. Um, after they meet and kind of issue a, a neutral verdict on independence, um, the members of the various association associator companies are not happy with this. And so they convene their own council of leaders and delegates from these militia companies and their supporters, uh, which essentially creates and usurps power from the old uh, Pennsylvania Revolutionary Council. Um, and they then uh, instruct the delegates to the convention to vote for independence and to take a more radical stance. Um, they also kind of pressure Congress in a number of ways through through kind of military force and intimidation. Uh, for example, uh, uh, some congressmen thought it would be a great idea to hold a uh, really fancy ball and, and party 
for George and Martha Washington when they arrived in town uh, on their way uh, to on, or on Washington's way to take uh, command of the troops in Boston. Um, and this was during a period where uh, the revolutionaries had been stressing um, uh, uh, thrift and um, you like, like kind of uh, avoidance of luxury and and kind of cancellation of parties and balls and big events in order to conserve um, uh, materials and money for the war effort. Uh, and so the militia commanders go to the Congress and they say, basically, uh, you know, if you throw this fancy party for the Washingtons, uh, we will riot. Um, and, and we will, uh, they almost, you know, the, the, the implied threat is, you know, we'll remove you from office and, and take control of the, of the revolutionary movement ourselves. Um, and it immediately causes Congress to back down and even to apologize uh, for their uh, um, hubris. Uh, so you can really see, and, and this, this is a, a recurring theme in the early stages and, and in the later stages of the revolution, is that there's this push and pull between the revolutionary leaders who, have, uh, who want to uh, achieve a distinct political goal um, in, in kind of either changing the uh, nature of the British Empire or creating a new republic uh, in America. Uh, and the uh, uh, more radical people kind of beneath them fighting in the revolution who oftentimes uh, have a little bit of a different goal, right? Have this goal of radical equality in uh, a new American society. Uh, are much more likely to favor independence over a negotiated settlement with the British Empire. Um, so there's always this push and pull between, uh, you know, the population, these militia groups, and later on even the continent elements of the Continental Army, which tend to be more radical, and then the colonial elite who comprise the Continental Congress, the uh, provincial governments, uh, and the the kind of revolutionary leadership cadre, uh, who tend to take more moderate and more careful steps. Now, yeah, in a lot of military histories. Um, these militia, the story of these militias is about their their performance in battle, which often is not as good as, as um, say, the Continental Army. But in your story, uh, it seems like the militia is primarily focused on exercising force against civilians or civilian institutions. Absolutely, yeah. And, and um, you know, the militia being used in battle was only ever supposed to be kind of a last resort. Um, and, you know, they're, they're thrown into battle kind of when, uh, when, when the chips are down and they're desperately needed. And, and as you said, uh, you know, most military histories uh, argue that, that the militia really perform uh, quite poorly uh, when they're put up against British redcoats, um, which, which really makes sense because the, the British army was the um, uh, most preeminent fighting force in, in the world, or at least one of them. Um, its soldiers at their best could fire three musket rounds a minute, um, you know, and they were trained to stand their ground and take fire uh, from an opposing line. Uh, this was an era where warfare was basically uh, two lines of people uh, standing about 100 yards apart uh, and firing muskets at one another until one side or the other ran away. Um, and the militia was just entirely not prepared for this. These were, um, you know, even less trained than, than today's National Guard. Uh, militia training usually consisted of um, day-long or weekend-long musters that occurred um, two to three times a year. Um, they would uh, engage in uh, usually a morning, kind of four to six hours of drills, um, which almost never included uh, live fire exercise, gunpowder and lead just being too precious uh, to waste on training. Uh, and then the rest of the militia meets were uh, tended to be kind of big parties. Um, they were uh, times for um, people who lived in, in predominantly rural communities uh, to get together and visit with one another and uh, uh, imbibe uh, beer and, and spirits uh, and, and really just kind of uh, gather. And, and they took on an atmosphere of almost a county fair. 
Um, and so, you know, these people were not really equipped to to take on a professional army. And it's it's the reason why that, you know, the the um, uh, Continental Army and, and the U.S. Uh, in general doesn't do well in the, in the uh, Revolutionary War until the Continental Army professionalizes during the, the winter of, of 76 mm. and 77. Um, but what the militia did excel at was being able to apply social pressure and, and uh, violent pressure on their neighbors. Um, so, for example, during the period uh, uh, leading up to the revolution, uh, when there was a boycott movement on British goods, uh, the militia was very good at uh, kind of arriving at the doors of people who refused to go along with the boycott, uh, coming armed with muskets and clubs and axes, um, kind of trying to convince these people to uh, sign on with the boycott movements and if they didn't kind of threatening them and sometimes destroying their property and then when the revolution break broke out these militias were good at um tracking down and intimidating uh potential loyalists or people who wanted to stay neutral in the conflict and forcing them to either sign oaths of loyalty to the uh, uh, various state governments that were emerging, uh, or in some cases, imprisoning them uh, if they refused to sign those oaths uh, or exiling them, uh, chasing them out of the town or the county um, if they continued their allegiance to the crown. Um, and so, yeah, the militia, you know, as a tool of repression uh, against civilians who didn't go along with the revolutionaries, um, they were they were quite effective in uh, in that role. Uh, and indeed, actually, recruitment into the militia could be a way for those who are wavering to kind of prove their revolutionary bona fides. Uh, you know, there's a couple of cases in which um, potential loyalists are actually punished by county committees by being forced to serve a certain time on militia duty. Now, uh, as we've been talking about these revolutionary militias, at some point the British army comes into many of these cities that, that, you're, that you feature in the book. Uh, did this experience of the revolutionary militia shape how the British army was welcomed into these cities? Absolutely. And in uh, a couple of them, uh, especially early in the war, um, the, t the, the residents of these cities kind of welcomed the British army. Um, they had known constitutional monarchy and, and kind of British imperial rule their entire lives. Uh, for many of them, the revolution itself was the disruption uh, rather than the British arriving. Uh, and they expected that uh, with a restored uh, British presence and a restored kind of uh, authority of the crown, uh, that they would soon be returned to the kind of status quo before the revolutionary uh, movement broke out. Um, and so you see a lot of people, especially uh, those involved in uh, transatlantic commerce, the merchants, uh, the shipbuilders, craftspeople, um, import export trade people, um, you know, really kind of hoping for a restoration of international trade, um, but also a restoration of the order that came under British rule of having regular courts in which you could sue neighbors for trespassing or for non-payment of debts, um, and kind of due process, which came with uh, British constitutional law and British constitutional rule. Um, and uh, at first, you know, th these people welcomed the British army as, as kind of rescuing them from what they saw as the arbitrariness and the kind of dictatorship of these uh, revolutionary militias, these ad hoc kind of revolutionary governments. Um, who, after all, even though they claimed to be republics um, and they eventually became republics um, in the early revolution were not really elected and exercised a lot of their power through force. Um, and so the, the residents of a lot of these cities welcomed the army as, as kind of liberators from this, this, this revolutionary regime. 
Um, and they also saw it as an opportunity to kind of get back to business and, and to personally enrich themselves. Uh, you know, I, I uh, stumbled across the letter book of a merchant in Newport, Rhode Island, um, who two or three days after the, the British arrived, uh, was writing his suppliers in London and, and placing large orders uh, for hardware uh, that he could import and sell in Rhode Island and in New England. Um, so for a lot of these people, it was kind of, all right, now we can get back to business. Now we can kind of exercise some of uh, our old freedoms. Um, but pretty soon they realized that the British Army, at least in the short term, isn't interested in really restoring peace and, and law and order. What they're more interested in is using these cities as uh, military strongholds in order to suppress uh, the rebellion in the rest of the countryside, uh, as well as in determining the loyalties of city residents. Um, and they find the, the British army to be just as arbitrary, just as coercive uh, as the revolutionaries as time goes on. Now, when the British army took over Philadelphia, uh, what was that experience like for the residents? Did, did the British army uh, establish formal governance in the city? Uh, so uh, the experience depended on uh, uh, kind of your point of view. Um, you know, we have we have some diaries and some letters that uh, show people actually being really excited that when the British marched uh, marched through the city. Uh, Elizabeth Drinker, for example, a Quaker uh, uh, from a, a um, fairly well-off merchant family, um, you know, describes going out with her children to, to kind of watch the British forces march through the streets and uh, enter the city. Um, and it's almost kind of a parade atmosphere when they, when they come in. Um, for others, they, they uh, either have to flee or have to kind of go underground. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these include kind of the, the Congress itself, which gets out of Dodge about three days before the, the British Army occupies the city um, after Washington writes them a note that he can no longer guarantee Philadelphia's security. Um, so a lot of kind of revolutionary leaning people uh, just, just get out of Dodge. Um, and then uh, I forgot the second part of your question. Could you, could you restate it? Um how did the military government in Philadelphia govern uh, the city itself? Did they establish a civilian component? Yeah, so, so sorry, uh, the military government. Um, th so there were two components to it. There was a military commandant uh, who was in charge of the armed forces in the city. Uh, and it was his job to assign uh, barracks for common soldiers, uh, to find houses and rent rooms and inns for officers uh, who are not expected to be billeted uh, with their men, um, and uh, in general to kind of uh, contract for with local merchants for supplies and uh, uh, um, other necessities for the army. Uh, and the commandant was also in charge of dispensing justice, both to uh, civilians and soldiers. And this happened uh, in the form of kind of arbitrary justice at a military provost uh, jail, uh, as well as formal courts martial. Uh, arbitrary justice tended to happen kind of for petty crimes, uh, courts martial more for um, crimes involving uh, more capital offenses like desertion, sexual assault, murder, uh, robbery, uh, etc. Um, there is also a civilian component. The uh, British collaborated with uh, a uh, former prominent Pennsylvanian, Joseph Galloway, uh, who had once been a friend of Benjamin Franklin, a uh, prominent member of the Pennsylvania Assembly, uh, and even a member of the uh, First Continental Congress uh, until he decided that he could not go along with independence um, and he was not willing to renounce his loyalty to the crown. Uh, and they appoint him as uh, superintendent of the police of Philadelphia. Uh, and he has a staff of uh, about a dozen magistrates and uh, officers of the police. Uh, 
Uh, and their job is to control the civilian population, uh, to deal with complaints uh, by civilians um, about uh, the military, to, to kind of be a liaison between the commandant and the military's uh, justice system uh, and the civilian population uh, to adjudicate uh, disputes between civilians over property, uh, over trespassing, over what would have kind of been civil offenses or, or lawsuits um, when regular law and order was, was in place. Um, and to uh, point out and, and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, keep an eye on potential loyalists, potential people who were still, or sorry, potential revolutionaries, people who were potentially uh, disloyal to the crown. Uh, and in addition, they, they kind of did the mundane elements of city government. You know, they raised money for the poor. Uh, they made sure that uh, the street lamps were full of oil. Uh, they they hired street cleaners to uh, uh, clean up the pig and horse dung that that perpetuated the streets of uh, 18th century cities. Um, you know they they did all of the things that we would expect kind of a, a municipal civil uh, uh, city government uh, to do, um, but they did it kind of under the auspices of of a commission issued by the commander-in-chief of the British forces, uh, General William Howe. How did the British occupation of these cities affect the enslaved people who lived there? Uh, differently in different places, uh, though, though in general it gave uh, opportunities uh, for the enslaved to create new lives and even uh, in many cases to free themselves. Uh, so the British army from the, the very beginning of the conflict realized that uh, the enslaved people uh, in uh, the colonies, especially in the southern colonies, but also in the north, and, and uh, this is a time period where uh, there is kind of slavery in, uh, in the northern colonies, about a quarter of uh, New York City's population, for example, was uh, enslaved Africans and African Americans, uh, and about 10% of Boston's population was was enslaved. Um, so there were large uh, uh, enslaved populations even outside of kind of what we think of as their traditional slave colonies of the Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, and Georgia. Uh, but pretty early on, British governors and, and generals uh, decided to try to use enslaved people against the colonials, against the revolutionaries. Uh, in early kind of 1776, uh, Virginia's governor, the Earl of Dunmore, uh, issues a proclamation that uh, any enslaved people uh, of revolutionaries, of rebels, uh, who flee to the British army will be given their freedom uh, so long as they're willing to take up arms against their former masters. Uh, and this policy pretty much holds throughout the war, though with one or two exceptions. Uh, in New York in 1777, the commandant uh, issues a blanket order uh, that doesn't make a distinction between enslaved people belonging to loyalists or patriots. Uh, they say basically that any enslaved people that come from the countryside into the British lines will be free as soon as they cross into the uh, uh, into British territory. Um, and for many of these people, you know, they're, they're able to escape and uh, make it to British lines and use the British army to their benefit. Uh, a lot of them end up serving uh, both as soldiers in the British army um, and as uh, auxiliaries, as wagon drivers, as uh, construction workers, as uh, pioneers, which which um, were, were called uh, the what they used to call kind of combat engineers who built roads and cut down trees and dug latrines and, and so forth as armies uh, marched around uh, on campaign. Um, it gets a little more complicated uh, in the southern cities, uh, in Savannah and Charleston, uh, when British authorities arrived in 
1779 and 1780, they made sure to kind of uh, uh, differentiate between enslaved people belonging to those in rebellion who were granted their freedom uh, and enslaved people belonging to loyalists uh, who were to be returned to enslavement. Um, but they, they by and large kept their promise to enslaved people, at least those uh, who had fled from the revolutionaries. And there's uh, a really bizarre event that occurs in, in Charleston just uh, after the Battle of Yorktown in, in 1781, uh, in which uh, a number, a few dozen of these former enslaved people uh, actually hold a, a, a lavish ball uh, funded by British officers. Um, and they, they dress themselves up in uh, clothing uh, that they've appropriated from their former mistresses. Uh, they write out kind of uh, delicately cut, uh, sorry, calligra calligraphed uh, invitations. Uh, and uh, they're escorted by these, these British officers in gilded carriages and, and treated to fine food and, and fine wines and, and drinks. Um, and they, they kind of party it up until until about four in the morning. Uh, so you can see these these people really kind of uh, asserting themselves not only as free people, but as free people of a certain status and of a certain type of taste. Um, at the same time, though, gaining that freedom was was really risky. Uh, one of the best narratives that we have of uh, an enslaved person uh, making his journey to freedom during this period uh, is that of uh, the enslaved South Carolina carpenter, Boston King. Um, and he uh, ran off from his plantation in the South Carolina countryside in 1780 uh, to the British lines in occupied Charleston. Um, but he was almost re-enslaved uh, twice first by a British officer uh, who seized him and attempted to make him his personal servant. Um, and this was common, especially among uh, lower ranking officers, lieutenants, uh, uh, captains, and, and, uh, and the like, um, who found that they could make a tidy profit if they seized some of these escaped slaves um, and uh, either used them as personal servants or sold them uh, to merchants heading for the British Caribbean. Uh, and other historians have demonstrated that a lot of these enslaved people ended up re-enslaved in Jamaica and Barbados and other spots in the British Empire. Uh, and then King is, is al also almost re-enslaved again um, when he escapes from this British officer, makes his way to New York, uh, joins the crew of a British privateer, uh, and he's captured in Connecticut, um, and then very nearly re-enslaved by the revolutionaries. Um, and this was also really common. If blacks uh, were captured in arms uh, or in support of the British army, uh, they were almost certain to be re-enslaved by the revolutionaries for the rest of their lives. Um, and indeed, even in the later years of the war, as, as peace was, was uh, uh, emerging, as, as the peace treaty was being signed, uh, slaveholders were desperate to get back their enslaved property. Uh, George Washington, who had lost about a dozen enslaved people when the British Navy uh, paid a visit to his home at Mount Vernon in 1780, um, sends uh, uh, bounty hunters into occupied New York uh, attempting to reclaim his property that there isn't his human property uh, that uh, might be living there, these, these enslaved people uh, who have now become free and have been living for the previous two years in British New York. And in fact, uh, his enslaved butler, Harry Washington, uh, leaves on a British vessel for Halifax in 1783, only just a couple of days ahead of the slave catcher that Washington has sent into the city to uh, abduct him and bring him back to Virginia. Uh, so there's this kind of double-edged sword. 
Um, you know, on the one hand, enslaved people could make new lives for themselves. Uh, Boston King, for example, ends up leaving uh, and becoming a, a minister, a well-respected uh, Methodist leader in uh, Halifax and later in London. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of these people ended up re-enslaved, either in other parts of the British Empire uh, or back in the newly formed United States after the end of the war. Now, one of the topics that comes up is something that I wasn't expecting but I thought was really interesting, and that's the issue of theater during the British military occupation. Uh, you say that British officers uh, created a vibrant theater culture in these cities and that Philadelphia boasted perhaps the most sophisticated theater outside of New York. Uh, what role did theater play in British military culture? Yeah, so theater was uh, a way uh, essentially for British officers um, and uh, American civilians uh, to kind of unite as, as a single elite class. Um, so the British Army during this period was uh, very class segregated. Uh, enlisted men were drawn almost exclusively from the lower rungs of society. Uh, they were ex-convicts. Uh, they were thieves and drunkards uh, who had been given many times the choice between a jail sentence and uh, a term of enlistment in the army. Uh, if not that, they were landless second and third sons of poor farmers who couldn't afford to uh, pass on any part of their land or their inheritance to their children. And so these people joined the army. Uh, in other cases, they were they were simply kind of abducted into the army. Uh, there are these, these kind of uh, stories, some of which are, are most certainly exaggerated, but others kind of bear out. Uh, where people kind of remember getting drunk in a tavern uh, with an army recruiter um, and then wake up the next day, you know, in an army camp, uh, you know, in a red coat uniform. Um, so the, the uh, uh, enlisted members of the army themselves tended to be from kind of the poorer, more illiterate uh, side of society. Officers, however, tended to be kind of the opposite. They tended to be almost exclusively from the gentry class, uh, the upper and, and upper middle classes. Uh, and this was because in the British Army, you had to buy uh, a commission uh, in order to advance in, uh, in rank. Um, so uh, where you could kind of get in as an ensign or a lieutenant, um, you know, if you wanted promotion, you had to continually kind of buy into that. And so most of the officers, uh, especially at the rank of kind of captain and colonel and higher, uh, were, were quite wealthy, uh, uh, cultured, educated members of the British elite. Uh, many of them were also kind of members of parliament, uh, members of various university societies, um, and participants in the, the European Enlightenment. Um, you know, the, uh, um, one of the British generals who, who served in America, uh, John Burgoyne, was, was known as kind of Gentleman Johnny um, because of his, his uh, acculturedness and his um, flair for theater and, and the arts. Uh, and in Philadelphia, during the winter of 1777-1778, um, and, and armies tended not to campaign during uh, very heavily during winters, um, just because it led to um, much uh, much more heavy casualties, um, and and um, uh, there was kind of this tacit agreement that armies kind of wintered uh, in place and then resumed their campaigns in the late spring. Um, so in the winters in occupied cities, uh, you've got these these kind of elite gentlemen officers um, out of uh, away from home, kind of looking for things to do. Um, many of them turn to gambling and, and drinking, um, but others and, and sometimes the same ones turned to theater and they put on, you know, what we might think of today as as these kind of amateur theater productions. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, in New York, there was kind of the, the most sophisticated of these, which operated for the entirety of the war called the Theater Royal. Um, but Philadelphia had uh, a really vibrant uh, scene as well, led by um, Major John Andre, who was another one of these, these kind of very kind of cultured, sophisticated uh, British officers. Um, 
they put on a number of plays. Uh, these included um, uh, Shakespeare, kind of, so kind of classics of the, the British pantheon, uh, as well as more recent plays by authors like Sheridan and, and John Addison, uh, as well as farces uh, or comedies, a typical uh, a night at the theater would have been a double bill between uh, opening with a comedy and then uh, moving on to a more serious drama. Uh, oftentimes, these officers would kind of show off their wit and their skill uh, by rewriting lines to the play or, or kind of rewriting uh, epilogues and monologues in the play and, and kind of adding these in. So these were kind of interactive uh, performances. Uh, and they often involved uh, members of the local community, uh, especially women. Uh, these officers, uh, typically for female parts, recruited uh, wives and daughters of uh, the elites in these cities. Um, and uh, so they, they, these kind of also served as an opportunity uh, for these soldiers to kind of socialize with local women. Uh, in a way that was not scandalous, uh, that was not kind of as frowned upon as drinking with a woman in a tavern or or um, kind of cavorting with them uh, in uh, uh, in public otherwise. Um, and so the, the this theater kind of took on, uh, you know, a central place in the social lives of these officers um, and of the elite families that also participated in them. Uh, and in Philadelphia, they kind of culminate in uh, was probably the most bizarre and, and over the top theatrical production ever seen in, in revolutionary America, which was the Messianza, uh, which occurs in early spring of 1778. And this is a celebration of the departing General William Howe uh, and his brother, Admiral Lord, um, uh, uh, Admiral Lord Richard Howe. Uh, and what they do is uh, uh, engage in a regatta. They sail from Philadelphia a little ways south. Uh, they get off the ships uh, in a large field that's been decorated to look like a medieval tournament stage. Uh, British officers dress up as medieval knights with lances and swords and armor. Uh, American women uh, of uh, loyalist elites mostly uh, dress up as Turkish maidens, or at least what the uh, British officers thought Turkish maidens looked like. Um, and there's actually a uh, full-on medieval joust and tournament um, between two sets of uh, of, of soldiers. The, they call themselves the Knights of the Bleeding Rose and the Knights of the Burning Mountain and this kind of romanticized uh, fantasy. Uh, and they fight kind of for the honor of these American women. Uh, and then after the joust, which is declared a, a draw, um, they go to a, a large country house, uh, have a fireworks display, and they dance and eat and drink until uh, the wee hours of the morning. Well, that's going to have to be the last word. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, Donald Johnson is the author of Occupied America, British Military Rule, and the Experience of Revolution. Thank you for speaking with me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details.